2018, I had this great idea to start a book club, mostly because I love books. I particularly love audiobooks, and I love forcing them on other people and then talking about them. And so I started this book club and I just put it out there on Instagram. I said, hey, read this book and then let's come together and chat about it. And I wanted to share those chats with you here on my YouTube channel. So I hope you enjoy this video. Jojo Moyes, the giver of stars. I'll hold it back up again in a second. Jojo Moyes, the giver of stars. I'm super excited to talk about this book. I hope you are too. Um, my sister Emily said that she thinks that this book might have been her favorite book of the year, and so did um, one of my best friends, Lisa Hughes. And Lisa and I read almost all the same books, and um, uh, both of them said they think this might have been their favorite book of the year, and I might agree. I would put this in for sure, like probably my top three. Um, I don't know, I've read a lot of really great books this year. So, um, okay, let me give you a little bit of background. I, you know, when I get, um, pick a book and we get on for a book club, I always go and watch interviews of, and read um, interviews of the author. Okay, anyway, I was reading all about Jojo. She lives in Essex, um, England, and she, I think that's how you say that, Essex, England. Um, and she has a husband and three children, and they live on a farm. She was a journalist for 10 years, and um, she was writing on the side, like her writing fiction stories on the side. And her first, this is, this is so fascinating, her first three manuscripts got rejected. The first three books that she wrote got rejected. And then she wrote her fourth book and she decided, um, if this one doesn't get picked up, I'm done. And of course it got picked up. And she's written, I couldn't really count because she's got some like short stories and stuff out there. Let's see, six more books that didn't really do great. And then she wrote the book that we all know, probably everybody here, um, give me the little like girl raising her hand if you um, if you read me before you. Okay, let me see it. Girl raising your hand if you read me before you. It was an awesome book. If you've never read me before you by Jojo Moyes, it is a great book. It's about a man who um, is a paraplegic and he wants to commit suicide. And it's about a sunny, beautiful girl that comes to be his temporary caregiver, like as like a temp job. And um, it is such a great book. Um, you can also, it counts, I'm, mm, does it count if you only saw the movie? Look at all the hands going up. I love it. Um, if you only saw the movie, you have to give me a heart, okay? It doesn't count. You can't raise your hand if you didn't read the book. Chrissy said she cried like a baby. Um, okay, that book, I will never forget. I was reading the book and um, we had people coming over and I was almost finished and I was like, I was like on the verge of crying and the friends came. And I had to put it down and then read like the last five pages of the book. Um, and I didn't cry, but I thought the movie was an excellent adaptation. So anyway, that book um, went on to check this out. Um, I wrote this down 14 million copies, 19 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Also made it into a movie and I. Um, I, it's such a great book. And Jojo said that one of the encouraging things in an interview, I didn't actually talk to her, but she said that once people read that, they went back and read some of her other books and the sales of her other books picked up because, because of that book. So um, she since wrote two more books about the main character in Me Before You. I haven't read either one of them. Um, my mother-in-law has read both of them and gave them both to me. But um, as I've shared with you guys before, um, I don't read sequels. I don't usually like sequels. I like the story to just end. So if you read the sequel, comment, tell us if it was worth the read and I might go back and read. I don't know, I just wanna, sometimes I just wanna move on. Sometimes maybe I don't wanna go back, like if I just, if the book comes out, like the sequel comes out like two years later. I never read the sequels, but she wrote two sequels and then um, she, here comes this book, The Giver of Stars. And so this book, is about the pack horse librarians in rural Kentucky in the 1930s. And I love books that are set in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Um, I 
I love, obviously, books about books, and my favorite genre is books about women and female friendships. And so, um, like, this book just, like, hit everything that I love. Um, so, in an interview, the interview that I watched, JoJo said, um, she said, oh, somebody's saying you have to read the other two books. They're different, but so good. Okay, I might. Um, if they go on sale on Audible, <laughs> I will buy them. Um, okay, so JoJo said that she read this article that was about the Pack Horse librarians. And she um, immediately, she was like, the story just jumped out at me. She said, she said it was like, she immediately knew that she had to write her next book about these librarians. And then she said, I wrote this down because I just thought this was so fascinating. And if my husband's still watching, he's going to know exactly what I'm talking about when I read this. But she said, um, she like almost immediately hopped on a plane to Kentucky and she was like, I have to know more about these women and I have to write a book about them. And she said she was so nervous that somebody else was going to like stumble across this article and write a book about them um, that she was like had this automatic like sense of urgency that she had to get to Kentucky. She had to write this book. So she says this. She said, I knew that someone else might write it better but I was gonna write it faster. And I just love that because sometimes my husband and I have this discussion about like songwriting and stuff and how God, that how God is, he, he has a message that he wants to get out there and he's looking for a vessel to do that through. And I believe the same thing about creativity and about stories and how she just had this feeling like she was so compelled to write this story. And she said that it was a super easy book to write that it came like fairly easily as far as writing a novel goes. And um, she says that, uh, what else do I have written down here? Um, she, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute. Christine, get ready, I'm about to put you on. Um, she said that the title was just agony, trying to figure out how to title this book. And um, so we're gonna talk about the title in a second. But she also, I also read that she credited her days as a newspaper writer, um, for helping her be able to tell good um, stories that were concise. So I wanna bring on my friend, Christine Kane. Go Kane. Um, she's gonna join us and we're gonna talk about this. Hi. Hello, how are you doing? You are the best at doing this. I am? I'm Ka my daughter, Catherine, and I have been hanging off every word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my husband just commented, he said, Hmm, do I need to go to Kentucky to write another book? <laughs> Listen, I know so much about um, Jojo Moyes and her whole process of writing this book. Like, you and my husband would find this fascinating. She, like, immediately, she goes to Kentucky to um, this town called, okay, the town in our book is Baileyville, I think. And she go the actual town is called Beattiesville, where she went. And she got there, and it's like the... Um, the um, crystal meth capital of the world or something. And she was like super freaked out. She was like, I can't stay here. So she ended up staying at this woman's property that was like, I don't know, like like 50 miles outside of Beattiesville and um, in this cabin. And, and she talked about how she was so scared because the door didn't even have a lock on it. It just had like a little hook and eye. And oh. it was like super primitive. But if you go back and you look at the dedication, she dedicated the book to the woman, Barbara, who owned this, like, I think it was like a bed and breakfast, but it was like cabins or whatever. She dedicated the book to her because this woman just made her fall in love with the South and with people from Kentucky. And the woman read through because she was, you know, JoJo's English. She was really nervous about portraying um, Appalachia in um, a way that would be... Um, honorable to the people that lived there sure. and so the woman like would read through it and would talk to her and help her and make sure that it was like a, a great representation of them so anyway she dedicated the book to the woman who owned the place where she went to write and she still goes back there like she loves it so um okay they put a lock on the door i don't think they did i don't think they did um all right so chris tell me what'd you like about the book 
Uh, all the things, like, okay, so I love your recommendations. You know, I get it on Audible too because it's it helps when you're traveling. Um, I loved everything for all the same reasons you did, but even um, the themes of, I, I loved how it dealt with domestic violence. I love how it uh, dealt with sisterhood, empowerment. And um, for an English chick writing about an American city, she did brilliant because I'm from Australia. And so I'm always fascinated when I read books about the South, like, you know, because it, it, I'm reading it with very different eyes to even how you're reading it because I, it, right. it's so foreign to me. I felt this was one of the best books of capturing the South. Like for a foreigner like me reading a book about the American South in the 1930s, I'm like, I was so there. I was hooked I, I was so frustrated with you because I had so many papers due for grad school, but you recommended that book and I just, I, I couldn't stop. It was like just so captivating because there was good twists and turns um, and the relationships with the men I really liked too. I mean, as in uh, the men that sort of came through for, um, were just amazing as well as like, uh, I know I'm not, not stopping, but um. I thought she did a brilliant job of depicting the father-in-law and he would have been yep. very typical of that kind of man mm -hmm. in that day. Um, the husband? Bennett. Yes. Bennett? Oh, Bennett. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> my mind just went wild because you could actually draw 20 different conclusions about Ben. I mean, you, I mean, each of those characters alone could have been a book of just like psychoanalyzing the relationship. I loved how Bennett. open she left Bennett. Like it oh, was totally. so open for interpretation. Of like you're like what is going on with this guy is has he been abused by his father is is he struggling with his sexuality totally. like did he marry the wrong girl and he wants the other girl and i mean it she just left him so unanswered and so open but it was really fun and funny like that's what i thought because i had about 10 different but i thought it's so awkward that his dad's in the same cabin on the ship on the way back, and then he's in the house. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, you don't know anything. Did his dad abuse him? Did his dad beat him? Did his dad, like, I mean, that, you know, it, it, um, it was, and then she said just enough about the sex lives with the, you know, at, to go, wow, okay, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where this could go. And then the redemptive side of... Um, what was the name of the guy that she ended up with? Oh, Fred? Fred, yes. And just how honourable Fred was compared to Bennett. Yes. I thought it was pretty awesome. And I love, not to skip to the end, but one of my favourite, I love a book that where you, like, you love the, the secondary characters too and, oh. and how, like, just alive everybody feels and how in the, at the very end, and I want to talk to you about the blue book, okay? okay. But at the very end, the you know, they have their marriage annulled. She gets with Fred, and Fred marries the girl, you know, his high school sweetheart. And um, and then th then the girl, the high school sweetheart, comes asking for the blue book. Because Hello. you're like, you're like, oh well, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe he he'll be intimate with her. But then she comes asking for the book and you're like, oh, no. Oh, no, it didn't happening. even work there. That's why you wonder how many times. And you don't even know whether it actually happened any other time either. Right. Like, was he married before and got annulled? And <laughs> does every wife go looking for the blue book because she doesn't know whether she's actually consummated the marriage? <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm like, wow. I mean, what a apt ending I, I just thought she was genius i mean she was she was this genius about writing about the blue book and the wives but i thought she was very powerful with her writing about uh, their relationships with the animals too yeah with their horses yep totally i love a book where the animals are like almost have their own personalities yes yeah, and i'm not even a mammoth animal lover but i was there and um the mule, I mean, I, I was very emotional, like when I thought, was it the mule that was going to die? The Was it a horse or a mule? I don't, whichever, um, you know, when the flood came. And I mean, I was right there with Marjorie and th thinking, okay, you're saving lives. I was there with the animals. I don't know. She put you in the scenes. Um, I, I don't know. She, like I could, my daughter could read it and someone in grad school could read it and you 
both could totally get a ton of stuff out of it. That's what I thought was um, was so good about it because it, it it just I don't think there was any throwaway pages. I could not stop listening. I I totally agree. Um, okay, so the main thing I wanted I have I could talk to you forever I, yes. and I can talk <laughs> about books for forever. But um, what did you think about the title? Yeah, random. I mean, okay. If the title did not capture me, as in, if you had not, I'd walked past that book in the bookshop at, at the airports, you know, because that's, um, I don't know, a hundred times. If you know, and then when you, you know, how I always text you, give me something to, to read, and you kind of sending me your recommendations. Um, I thought, okay, I did think like at first because um, when I went and looked it up that cover came up, you know, in the Audible books. And uh, the title, it just had never grabbed me. Even now, it still kind of doesn't. Okay, do so I'm going to be, me. full disclosure, okay. Donna, Donna says she wouldn't have picked up that title. No. Um, I picked it up, I don't know what made me read it. It was Reese Witherspoon's book club pick. Okay. And I think I just read a synopsis and I saw 1930s, librarians and I'm like okay so um but I honestly went through the entire book and I was like I never caught why she called it the giver of stars and yesterday when I was prepping I googled it I was and? like why is it called the giver of stars so and this happens sometimes when you do an audiobook you sometimes like miss okay. small details so I don't know if you remember the scene where Marjorie, not, not Marjorie, Alice yeah. is, um, she's like really sad about her relationship with her husband. She doesn't know if they've consummated their marriage or not. She's like super confused. They've got this blue book that they're passing around, which for those of you who <laughs> haven't read the book, if you're listening to this, it's a book about sex and the women are all like, not the blue book <laughs> they're all which is so funny because it like sex is just such a hard thing for women to talk about but especially a hundred years ago oh, listen there was no sex ed there was no like, there was nothing. nothing there was nothing mothers didn't talk to daughters about it <laughs> so they have this little secret book that gets passed from woman to woman and so she um the guy fred he gives her a book of poetry and he says um you know that you might like you might like these poems. Poetry is really personal. Blah blah blah. And she reads a poem called "The Giver of Stars," and the poem is it's super short. Here I'm going to read it. It says this: "Hold your soul open for my welcoming. Let the quiet of your spirit bathe me with its clear and rippled coolness. That loose limbed and weary I find rest, outstretched upon your peace on a bed of ivory." And then the next sentence is like, Alice got up to get the blue book. And, and so the book just like, the poem just really moves her and kind of makes her realize that she doesn't even know what intimacy with a man is. And so she goes to get the book. And I had, I mean, I literally had to go back and figure all of that out today. And I was listening to this interview and it was a really long, it was like an hour and a half, and I'd had it on in the background. I was about to shut it off. And the, the interviewer goes, let's talk about the title. And I was like, yes. I want to hear her talk about this title because I didn't think it, I didn't think it like, again, like it doesn't grab you. It doesn't tell you what the books are out. It's not catchy. It's, you know, like. Yes, so, I know. I was, I was not going to pick it up. <laughs> so here's what she says. She says, um that she originally, that her working title the whole time was called The Knowledge. And everybody in England didn't the like the title exactly. because well, of the taxi yeah. test or whatever. Yes, the knowledge. And so yeah. it just completely got X'd. And she said they went, it was so interesting to me because she starts off the interview talking about how this book came so easy for her. But then she could, they could not land on the title and they went around and around for months. And she said they even started um, looking through country music titles and lyrics to see if they could find something, you know, that like everybody knows or something that's like cheeky or whatever. And they finally landed on naming it after this poem, which was an actual poem because I looked it up 
and it's like that was an actual poet amy lowell and um it's like a, a book of poetry that's supposed to be sensual but i don't i don't know how i don't know i, but, I, I um, found out when they were reading it in the book i, I mean my english lit ha went off when i was listening to that part uh, you know when they read that well i heard it because i didn't read it the uh, the thing that um it's stunning though because i think later on in the book do you remember when um he wouldn't kiss her he wouldn't touch her and he said um i'm giving you words which was uh the words in the books that, um, that poem do you oh shoot do you remember that part where he wouldn't um he said i'm a man of intent you're still married and um uh, he said oh with fred well, yes with fred all i have to give you is words so that would circle back around to when he gave her that book you know what i mean like it's and that that poem was in yeah. there and so i just wonder like when when you read i thought i remember that and i remember later on he said basically i can't touch you i'm giving you words through books and um that was it kind of makes sense i mean it's still abstract to me i still wouldn't have picked up the book based on the title um <laughs> but but it does tie in and that ties in even to their intimacy because it's like i i'm not touching you this is all i can give you right now so it's pretty wild i think so too <laughs> um and i i just i i think it's cool i'm like i like knowing if i can figure out why you named the book that way i can get on board with it totally. but i also as a wife of an author and you're an author you know how important a title is and it's just like i'm thankful that she had a name that would carry the book because if she if her name wasn't on the book i don't know how how well it would have and gone. i'm thinking you know i've never sold did you say it was 14 million copies of the other book 14 million yeah yeah you know it doesn't matter what she calls her next book it doesn't matter <laughs> Unlike Pastor Stephen and I, it really does matter what we call it. But she, she can You're call right. whatever she wants. <laughs> but um, and she's also just such a, a gifted writer. Um, yeah. And I think I, I loved everything. I loved because um, it puts you as a woman, and of course, both of us, you know, we're so committed to women and watching women fulfil their purpose. To see where you know, almost a hundred years ago, where women were at, like you just. You know, she tries to, her best shot at life is to get out of her little English life to move to the other side of the world in the hope that there's going to be a bit more freedom, a little bit more. And then she's got to shrink right back into that kind of Southern Belle kind of lifestyle and life is small and gossip and slander and a woman is trapped. So even to the point that she was being, you know, trapped. she got, she got yeah, trapped and then beaten by her, fa her father-in-law. Father-in-law. And still the thought would be, I should stay. Like, I mean, you know, just insane. Like, it, but, that, but she had no other options, no money. And her family was like... Her parents were like, I'm not taking you back. So if a woman's family would not take her back... She was it, stuck. She's stuck in this abusive marriage. This, like, it's just, man, oh, man, we've come. Thank God we've come a long way. Yeah. And the truth is, though, I was thinking, uh, because I know that I have a, a person that I'm in relationship with that I think that is still a reality for some women. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. it that, you know, they're, they're thinking of the children or whatever. And, and so they're in a, what could be a violent kind of situation of which, you know, I'm just such an advocate of you've got to get out of anything that is violent in order to be in a safe place before you can work on anything. But to think back then there was not even the choice to get out in a safe place. And, and the one that was that helped her, is the one that everyone thought was like this immoral. Well, Marjorie has all her baggage from being a child and all the abuse and abusive and father. Oh my gosh! Again, the same sort of thread. But that would not have been uncommon back. Like so, it wasn't right. that, that. I didn't get any thread of I hate men. It wasn't like that. It was just here no. is a, a picture. It was actually quite loving because it was men that brought the redemption. So that's what I think set it apart. Because I'm also hyper aware that I don't yes. want books that pull down one gender to pull yes. up another gender. I don't feel she did that at all. I feel nope. like um, totally agree. redemption actually came from men. So I, I love those sort of books, you know, I think. Um, and she did that beautifully because it was um, loving. So there was a great sisterhood and the girls all stuck together, but it was men that really came through and um, what they lacked in love from their father. And, you know, it, it was something that a man healed. I thought it was powerful. Of course, I'm always going to get a bit spiritual. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. So who was your favorite? Who was your favorite woman? 
Like, were you oh. more Mar like Marjorie or yeah, Alice? I, well, yeah, I would resonate more with Marjorie because I'm a little bit, um, for want of a better phrase, you know, spiritual gonadsy. Um, I'm out there and it's just me and my horse. Not that I'm into animals, but it would be my car. Um, but it was her resilience and she's got great compassion so there's a very tender heart which is obvious from how she went to help and save lives and um the fact that she fought for that library she fought for those women she uh, you know made sure she was inclusive ethnicity race gender uh, she's very so there's this thick veneer but uh, let me just say it i don't mean to be so blunt it's it's not that she was hard. She just won't take crap. She could just tell the difference between what's crap and what's real. And that would be me. I go to people, I'm, I'm not really as hard as you think. It's just I've got zero tolerance for crap. But, you know. And she was I, a fighter. Totally. And she's like, I'm going to fight for what's right. Yeah. I, That's what um, I liked. She fought and she just stood up to the father-in-law and the injustice. Of, uh, you know, and then the mother's heart came through of course when you know she's in jail and gives over her daughter has the baby uh, she gives the baby away it. but like it was so well done too the way that she was breaking like she all you were cheering so hard for her you're like don't give up don't give up but she really like she got to a place where she was so depressed and she was so broken and she was so hopeless and then lo and behold it's a woman who comes oh. to her rescue and speaks for her and before you go, can we just talk about, have you ever read a book where the murder weapon was a book? I was so fired <laughs> up at the book. Okay. That's sheer genius, though, to write a book about books and a book is the, you know, and, and oh, man, I, I could say so much, but you, yes. I love how, like, you, yeah. throughout the, there's, like, this thread throughout the story where, because, you know, she starts you off in the beginning with this man who's like attacking her. And then throughout the story, they keep saying, where's little women? Who has little women? And there, and nobody, and nobody knows. And I kept like, it, I, I kept wondering why, why do they keep saying, where's little women? Like I didn't make the connection until the end when they tell you that it was a murder weapon. And just even the irony of her using that type, that book, oh, totally. Little Women. And, you know, of course, back then, um, the big argument is don't let a woman be educated or learn how to read. Um, right. Because a woman that knows how to read is, is a powerful woman. So what did the father-in-law keep trying to do? Shut down the library, shut down the library, shut down the library. And it's kind of, um, I mean, just in a very personal way, even though I'm from another country, another time, because I grew up in a Greek Orthodox um, home, I grew up, very Greek where a woman could never be more educated than a man. So I remember my my parents would say, you know, at school, don't try to excel too much because if you're too smart, no boy's ever going to want to marry you. No one's ever going to date you. And I was um, engaged at 18 and um, to a Greek man and I was accepted into university and his mother said, um, my son didn't go to university, so you have a choice. You can come and it was, it, it, he sort of owned a fruit and vegetable shop. You can come and work in the fruit and vegetable shop, um, but you can't go to, uh, if you're going to marry him, but this is enough that his mother is telling me this. I don't know what else I need to tell you that his mother is, <laughs> um, but you can't, you can't. <laughs> Clue number him. one, that you yes, need to run. <laughs> yeah, that's the lesson for everyone. You can't marry him. Um, it's your choice, basically university or, um, or that, because it was like a Greek girl should not be more educated and doesn't need, you don't need a degree. I would have heard, a thousand times growing up, you don't need a degree to get married and have kids. You don't need a degree to get married and stuff. You know, like it was just um, this constant thing. So I kind of really get a lot of the countries we work with in A21, the thinking would still be the same. And it's just interesting to go, wow, in rural Kentucky, just a hundred years ago, there was still shut down the library. You don't want the pretty little women to have the book because they might kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how like reading reading is so powerful Absolutely. and it's free i mean the the library they were, it was free and it and it's and how books can set you free oh, and you stories think how, you think how many and that common theme of abuse i know you know i came from a background of 12 years of abuse i a part of my saving grace was books i would that's the only place 
I, uh, th that escape, books were like my best friend until I could get out, you know, and, and get out from that situation. And so I always say the right book in the right hands at the right time can just change your life, literally. Yeah. Yeah. I love All it. All right. <laughs> I love, we could talk I love about you. <laughs> I love you so much. Thanks for hopping on. All right. It's been my pleasure. I love you all.